Since the trial of Jodi Arias, many have examined the history of her case and her ultimate conviction, largely due to the overwhelming public interest and media attention that her case received. No jury is going to convict me. Why not? Because I'm innocent, and you can mark my words on that one. No jury will convict me. We, the jury, duly impaneled and sworn, and the above entitled action upon our oaths do find the defendant as to count one first degree murder guilty. But a shockingly small percentage of those people are aware of an important recent development in her case, a legal issue that could open the door to an outcome that few could have ever imagined. What if I told you that Jody Arias plans to eventually leave prison? And it can be argued that she won an important first legal step in her ultimate plot to someday walk free. Now, most people who are even remotely familiar with her case would likely hear that and laugh at the absurdity of that statement. But I assure you, we have not heard the last from Jody Arias. In today's episode, we will explore through the mind of a calculated and methodical manipulator who will stop at nothing to get what she wants. And I will explain the incredibly important ruling in her recent appeal and why it is something that we cannot ignore or overlook. We will revisit the history of a diabolical schemer who throughout the history of her case consistently and repeatedly demonstrated the mindset of a person bound and determined to get whatever she wanted, no matter what the cost or who she hurt along the way. And we will also review the important legal issues that have arisen since her conviction that play an important role in her current efforts to alter her sentence and someday leave the confines of her imprisonment. This is Lies, Deception, and the Plot for Freedom, the Jody Arias case, episode 5. Jody had already called half a dozen times that day, but Donovan knew that calls that came in the evening had to be answered, especially now that Jody had someone on the outside who she trusted and could do her bidding. Since her release from prison in March of 2009, Donovan Baring had worked hard to adjust to life outside of the confines of the scheduled and rigorous nightmare that was prison life. From the day she was released, she was eager to help her friend, someone she had grown fond of over the many months that they had been incarcerated together. Jody wasn't just a friend to Donovan. She was like family in every sense of the word. Donovan and her wife Tracy had grown exceedingly close to Jody Arias during their incarceration together. Every night they would spend time together in their shared cell, discussing their cases, their lives, and even deeply important spiritual values that Jody seemed to have in common with Tracy. Within the first few weeks of meeting Jody, they developed such a closeness that when Jody offered to give them custom tattoos, they accepted without thinking twice. Using a mixture of baby powder, graphite, shampoo, and dark black mascara, Jody fashioned an illegal homemade tattoo gun with a sharpened point fashioned from a staple to give her new best friends something they would carry with them for the rest of their lives. Over the course of several months, the trio would become a tight-knit group that often shared their darkest secrets, with Jody even explaining how and why she committed the crime against Travis. The trio were so close, in fact, that when Jody offered to marry the two in an impromptu ceremony, the couple agreed, and Jody officiated their jailhouse wedding. So it would be something of an understatement to say that Donovan Baring became one of Jody Arias' biggest supporters during that time, and even after she left to serve the rest of her time in Perryville Women's Prison, they continued to stay close. And that was why when Donovan was finally released from prison, she was so eager to help Jody, because she had only ever seen her as a kind, loving, and supportive friend. Donovan had not yet witnessed the cold-hearted monster that Jody had been portrayed as by the media. In fact, while they were still together, Donovan and Tracy had given Jody Arias a special nickname that they believed accurately described their new best friend. To Donovan and Tracy, she wasn't the infamous homicidal inmate Jody Arias. Instead, they gave her the nickname 
Songbird. Over the next few weeks, Jody would regularly call throughout the day, sometimes as much as 10 times per day, but it didn't phase Donovan that she was being so persistent. She knew what it was like to be locked up without any connection to the outside world, and even though the world hated Jody, she was still committed to her friend. But nothing could have prepared Donovan for the wrath that Jody was about to pour out and that she would witness with her own two eyes. Because that was the day that Jody Arias would ask her best friend Donovan Baring to start down a dark and ominous path. A path that involved harassing everyone and anyone who dared to speak out against Jody on social media and to do anything short of breaking the law to silence them. Donovan Baring became the voice of Jody Arias. She was the sole person responsible for all of Jody's social media accounts, including her MySpace, Twitter, and Facebook accounts. And every single day, Jody would call and have Donovan read every post, every comment, and every untoward word because the incarcerated narcissist simply could not go a single day without knowing what people were saying about her. And if anyone who had ever known Jody dared to make a rude or unkind comment about her or her case, she would make certain that they would live to regret it. But Jody couldn't leave it there. She began to keep a list of all the people who were speaking negatively about her and then directed Donovan to begin an onslaught campaign against those people who had the unfortunate displeasure of making Jody Arias' death note. The list of people that Jody wanted targeted grew day by day and existed only for the express purposes of attacking, harassing, and shaming every person on it into hiding or submission. And if anyone she knew ever spoke in favor of the death penalty, Donovan Baring was instructed to become Jody's virtual hitman, making certain that they knew Jody was watching them and that she would not forget. Jody would continue to weaponize her friendship with Donovan for years to come, using her as an avatar to direct her vitriol and rage at anyone who spoke poorly of the infamous inmate. A fury that Jody was about to aim at her own family while telling Donovan to be the one to pull the trigger. But it was what Jody was about to ask Donovan to do next that would fundamentally change her understanding of Jody's case and the horrors of what happened on June 4th, 2008. Jody Arias's obsessive and dysfunctional need to win every battle by any means necessary would persist for many years to come. In fact, to this very day. While Jody Arias certainly is not the criminal mastermind she clearly believes herself to be, it would be a mistake for anyone to think that her ceaseless need to prevail is still not very much at play. And Jody's insatiable urge to control the outcome of her case received its first triumph within the wording of a 29-page opinion written by the Arizona Court of Appeals. And what was written on those pages is something that most people do not fully understand, but I assure you, Jody does. And the words of that opinion may serve to haunt the very people who have continued to disregard it, which is precisely why I want to share it with you today and why the words within that appellate court's ruling may open a door that most people were convinced would remain sealed shut. So without further ado, let's begin. When we last met, we left Jody Arias during her interrogation with Detective Flores, where both were in a four-dimensional game of chess that Jody had lost long before she had even begun. But today, I want to skip ahead to Jody's trial because there is something within the scope of her jury trial that we need to discuss and understand. The trial of Jody Arias would begin on January 2nd, 2013, and right out of the gate, Prosecutor Juan Martinez wasted no time in telling the jury exactly what he thought of Jody Arias. This is not a case of who done it. The person who done it, the person who committed this killing, sits in court today. 
It's the defendant, Jody Ann Arias. From the very beginning of the trial, Juan Martinez would consistently and repeatedly show the jury, the judge, the defendant, and anyone who dared to testify exactly who was in charge. Ma'am, take a look at Exhibit 413. You recognize that exhibit, correct? Yes. And that's a picture of you, correct? Yes. Right here. And the other one is a picture of your dumb sister, Angela, correct? That's my sister. She's not dumb. But I honestly think, talking about Angela, she's a little bit dumb. You said that, right? Yes, I called her dumb and stupid. Did I ask you whether or not you called her stupid, ma'am? No. I asked you whether or not you called her dumb, right? Yes. This was one of the more notorious interactions between Prosecutor Juan Martinez and Jody Arias during the many days of her testimony at trial. What we observe in this moment is the clear intent by the prosecutor to show the jury the true nature of Jody Arias and how she was willing to attack and belittle anyone, including her own family members, who were entirely undeserving of her vile and hateful mischaracterizations. Now, before I go any further, I want to be crystal clear about something that remains at the foundation of this entire case. Jody Arias is not the victim. She is the perpetrator, and she deserves to remain in prison for the rest of her natural life for the crimes that she committed. But it's at this moment that I want to bring your attention to something that is going to be deeply important as we continue. And it's not Jody Arias. I want you to pay attention to the prosecutor. You worked at Mimi's Cafe, right? Yes. You had been working that day, right? Yes. Your shift was over, right? Yes. What time did your shift start? It varied. That day? What day? What time did your shift start? In the morning. What time? Sometime in the morning. Now, I think we can all agree that Jody is doing what Jody does best. And that is trying to control the outcome of the conversation by being unnecessarily difficult and not answering the prosecutor's questions directly. And that was indicative of the entirety of the time that Jody testified. She almost seemed to relish in any opportunity to win a semantics battle. And we can also all agree that Prosecutor Martinez held her feet to the fire. And that's something that is incredibly hard for any prosecutor to navigate. Specifically, how to cross-examine a defendant who is actively trying to mislead the jury into believing baseless and provable lies. He was clearly trying to show the jury that she was not the innocent, mousy librarian she was cosplaying. A woman who now claims that she was the victim, someone who was simply defending herself. Which is exactly why I think a vast majority of people who watched the trial were so supportive of Prosecutor Juan Martinez because of the fact that he expressed his exasperation with Jody's lies. Over the years, many who have praised him have pointed out how Prosecutor Martinez showed the jury how deceptive Jody Arias truly was. And despite Jody's defense team's numerous attempts at asking Judge Sherry Stevens to direct Prosecutor Martinez to change his tone and approach, he never once backed down. But you may be surprised to learn that the very thing that the general public enjoyed and appreciated about Prosecutor Martinez is the primary issue that the appeals court had with the entirety of Jody Arias' trial. Um, I don't know. Do you have a problem with your memory? I mean, this was approximately no more than two weeks away. I don't think I have a problem. But you don't remember things that happened two weeks of, within two weeks, do you? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And in this case, you don't, right? Um, I don't remember if I gave you the details. So the answer is not. yes or no. Do you remember? Remember what? What are we talking about? We're talking about the incident. Right. And what, what specifically of the incident are we talking about? Um, I'm not sure. So you're having trouble focusing on what's being asked of you today in addition to having memory problems? Yes. Over the course of the lengthy trial, Prosecutor Martinez would routinely grill Jody and the defense witnesses any time that he noticed that their testimony seemed to veer off course. It's very clear that he was attempting to impeach each person's credibility to the jury, 
to show that their statements were not consistent with prior remarks that they had made. And there were many times where Prosecutor Martinez was effective in demonstrating Jody's propensity to lie and to alter her story and how it changed to suit whatever new version of events she was now telling. And the reality is that Prosecutor Juan Martinez did have a difficult task of substantively proving that Jody Arias was lying about virtually every aspect of her defense. A defense that began with her alleging that she was not in any way responsible, which then evolved within a few short weeks to unknown intruders having perpetrated the crime, and then finally, years later, landing on her final admission of having committed the crimes against Travis once she knew that the evidence definitively proved that she was responsible. I do not envy the position that he was in as a state prosecutor, not only as a professional who is tasked with the overwhelming responsibility of prosecuting a well-established pathological liar, but also writing the line between what is ethical and what is not. I'm not asking you to interpret anything. If you don't understand the question, ask me, and we will repeat it for you. You dropped the knife. Where did you drop it from, if not your hand? Presumably my hand. I just don't remember gripping it. Did I ask you whether or not you had gripped it? That's what I took it as. No, did I ask you whether or not you were gripping the knife, ma'am? You didn't use those words specifically. Right. I asked you whether or not the knife was in your hand. Do you remember that? And again, we see Prosecutor Martinez trying to get Jody to just tell the truth, to admit that she premeditated this entire crime, that despite how she claimed she was treated, that she was not attacked by Travis, and that she went into his house for the express purpose of ending his life. She knew exactly what she was doing, and the claims of her being in a fog or going to the closet to retrieve a weapon, that all of it was a poor attempt at trying to avoid responsibility for a crime that she alone perpetrated. And if you've ever had the displeasure of trying to confront a pathological liar, then you know exactly how frustrating that entire experience can be. In fact, Travis himself tried on numerous occasions to get Jody to tell the truth whenever she was caught in a provable lie, and yet she always maintained that she was the aggrieved party and would somehow find a way to become the victim. And I cannot even begin to imagine how aggravating it must have been to try and cross-examine Jody Ann Arias, because she wasn't interested in the truth. She was only interested in and getting away with this crime. Throughout the trial, we can see her trying to manipulate the jury into thinking and believing that she was somehow deserving of being exonerated. It's why she routinely answered questions while looking at the jury directly. But as the trial continued, it would seem that Prosecutor Martinez was going to give every defense witness the same intensity that he gave Jody Arias. The reason was that you wanted to give her something, right? No. Well, you did give her something, didn't you? Yes. And there is a code of ethics, correct? Yes. And that code of ethics prohibits you from providing gifts to somebody like the defendant, doesn't it? It wasn't a gift. Sir, isn't it true that it went over and it got to her, didn't it? She was suicidal at the time. I'm not asking you whether or not she was suicidal. Right? Am I asking you that? No, you're not. And if she was suicidal, you're not the treating physician, are you? I'm not treating her. Well, if she was suicidal, it was somebody else's responsibility to take care of it, right? Judge, objection. Can we ask the state not to yell at the witness? It's not necessary. This infamous exchange between Prosecutor Martinez and Dr. Samuels would become one of the more explosive parts of Jody's trial within the media. Dr. Richard Samuels was hired by the defense to meet with and assess Jody Arias for the express purposes of giving his assessment of her mental health status while she was incarcerated. At this point of the trial, Prosecutor Martinez is trying to demonstrate to the jury what he believes is a bias in Dr. Samuels' relationship with Jody Arias. Over the course of several days of testimony, Dr. Samuels is grilled concerning his diagnosis of Jody having PTSD mainly because the doctor's methods were inconsistent and his record-keeping was, at the very least, completely unprofessional. 
But you again may be surprised to learn that this entire back and forth between these two men is one of the primary issues that the appellate court had and discussed in their opinion concerning Jody's request for a new trial. While a vast majority of people who watched the trial and witnessed this back and forth believe that it demonstrated the psychiatrist's inherent bias towards Arius, the appellate court was far more concerned about something else entirely. But before we delve into their opinion and why it directly correlates to Jody's incessant need to win at all costs and to someday walk free, I want to revisit a few final clips from Jody's trial. You know what a clinical interview is, right? Of course I know what a clinical interview is. All right, then we seem to be having problems with it. With regard to a clinical interview, ma'am, isn't that a situation where you sit across from an individual and you talk to them about the issue that is at hand? Isn't that true? You interview them. You ask questions. You do an assessment. So when you are interviewing, you're not talking then, right? Mr. Martinez, yes I think... Yes or no? My question is, are you talking yes or no? Mr. Martinez, are you angry at me? Ma'am, is that relevant to you? Is that important to you? Ladies and gentlemen, please refrain from laughing in the courtroom. Is that important to you whether or not the prosecutor is angry to you with regard to your evaluation? Does that make any difference to your evaluation whether or not the prosecutor is angry? Yes or no? It, it makes a difference to me the way I'm spoken to and I would like you to speak to me the way I speak to you. I still remember watching this part of the trial and like most people laughing at the absurdity of it all. Over the years, many people have characterized the defense experts as quacks and being awful at their jobs, and that Prosecutor Martinez was simply trying to expose their intentional bias and even question the validity of their diagnoses. In fact, if you've seen my most recent video covering the Darley Routier case, you may recall that expert witness shopping is a reoccurring problem within the criminal justice system. Now, what I mean by expert shopping is that regardless of what side of a case you may be on, there is likely an expert willing to testify on your behalf for a fee. Now, that's not to say that their professional opinions are for sale, but they often do lean in one direction or the other. But throughout the Jody Arias trial, Prosecutor Martinez was praised for his tenacity and willingness to go after every little issue that was incorrect, misstated, or was an outright lie. And if there was ever a case that demonstrates the enormous gap between the general public's interpretation of a trial and how much that view differs from how the law and appeals courts view that same trial, the case and trial of Jody Arias is the single best example I have ever seen. Because at the heart of this entire case is the uniform desire to ensure that Jody Arias remains in prison. She lied countless times, denied her involvement, lied about false intruders breaking into Travis's home, only to finally arrive at admitting to perpetrating the crime, but only then to land on a story where she claims that she's the victim. I believe that Prosecutor Juan Martinez spoke the way that all of us would want to speak to Jody Arias if we were the ones ensuring that she was held accountable. But if you've ever seen my content, then you may already know what I'm about to say. Defense attorneys, judges, and especially prosecutors, they are all held to a higher standard. And as hard as this may be to conceive, what Prosecutor Juan Martinez did during Jody Arias' trial has opened a door that should have remained shut. We are here for oral arguments in cause number CR 150302, State of Arizona versus Jody Arias. On March 24th of 2020, the Arizona Appellate Court issued their ruling to Jody Arias' appeal. And while they denied her the right for a new trial, what they wrote in their opinion was nothing short of scathing. Since the appellate ruling came out, Many news outlets have only focused on the fact that Arias was denied a new trial, but it would seem that a vast majority of those same people never bothered to read the substantial, critical, and scalding rebuke they issued. Now, to those who watched the trial, it may seem inconceivable that 
any substantial wrongdoing occurred, and certainly not to any degree that would in any way benefit Jody Arias. But a panel of three appellate judges would completely disagree with you. Their opinion was 29 pages long, 20 pages of which was dedicated solely to the issue of what they determined to be prosecutorial misconduct that undeniably permeated this case and that a pattern of intentional misconduct saturated the trial. With one of the appellate judges even referring to the trial itself as having been a mishandled circus. Now you may be asking the question, why does their opinion even matter if Jody was already denied a new trial? Well, I am going to answer that at length, reviewing the appellate court's opinion and why it is vitally important to the future of Jody Arias' case. But before we do, I want to show you what the high standard for all prosecutors actually looks like. Because this is what I mean when I say how high the bar is set for all practicing lawyers, but especially prosecutors. My name is William Brown. I'm the Deputy District Attorney of Dane County. Yesterday you met Andrea Raymond. Together we're the prosecutors in the case. Uh, you heard a little bit about how the process worked in jury selection and you probably thought you were being strung along the whole time and, and in a bit you were. Uh, Everyone was trying to gauge your knowledge of the case, maybe any preconceived notions you had about the criminal justice system. Uh, Ms. Vera asked you a lot of questions about what you would think if she did nothing and sat there. And, and those were good questions. Um, I won't do nothing in this case because it would be a very short trial if I did. Uh, you are watching the Deputy District Attorney Prosecutor William Brown during his opening statements at the trial of Chandler Halderson. Prosecutor William Brown is the embodiment of what a professional and justice-minded prosecutor does during a highly media-saturated trial, how they conduct themselves, and most importantly, how they treat witnesses, defendants, and the defense in front of the jury. Our job in a case is to present evidence. That means to call witnesses. The judge talked about what evidence is. When we think of evidence, sometimes we think of, especially a murder case, you're in a murder case, you think of the gun. And you'll get that, there'll be a gun, you'll see that. But evidence is so much more. The first thing evidence is, is the first thing the judge mentioned. Evidence is first the sworn testimony of witnesses, both on direct and cross-examination. When people raise their right hand and they swear to tell the truth, that's evidence. Now you as jurors can decide whether you believe it or not. Does this person have any bias or prejudice? Do they have anything to gain by what they're saying? Do they have anything to lose? All those things are up to you, but sworn testimony is evidence. Photographs are evidence, videos are evidence, statements made by people involved in the case, including Mr. Halderson, are evidence. Now, I'm going to date myself for a moment, but I grew up watching old reruns of Perry Mason. And while that was simply a TV drama that was born in a very different time under very different circumstances, but even as a child, I always marveled at his ability to prove a case without ever having to raise his voice or lose his temper, which would later translate into my actual career when I would work with some of the best attorneys I had ever had the pleasure of knowing because they would communicate with professionalism, with intelligence, and without having to exploit the emotions of the jury in order to affect the most important part of any jury trial, the pursuit of justice. You'll find the evidence in this case is overwhelming. Now, over the next couple of weeks, I'll make you a couple promises as your prosecutor in this case. I'm not here to waste your time. But of all the constitutional rights we talked about of Chandler, he has them. I want you to respect them. There's another one that you should know, which is this is the only time we get to have this trial. You get one trial in the United States of America, and I have to do it right. So if that means calling a lot of witnesses, I apologize in advance. If it means calling experts to say things that maybe you already know, I apologize in advance. But I'm gonna do my job right as your prosecutor. Second, you're going to see terrible photographs. To the extent possible, we're using cleaner photographs that were taken by the Den County Medical Examiner. I promise you, I'm not trying to pull on anyone's heartstrings. I'm not trying to make this 
overly emotional, you might feel emotional. I suspect many of you have never seen anything like what you're going to see in the next couple of weeks. But I promise to do my best to limit the amount. And lastly, I promise to just ask questions, a lot of questions, because you're the jury in this case, and you deserve to hear absolutely everything. It will be a struggle. You'll get sick of walking back and forth to these jury rooms. You might get sick of each other. I hope not. But it's an important task. What happened here shouldn't happen. But it did. And so in a couple weeks when I stand up here and Ms. Raymond stands up here, I'm going to ask you to deliver a verdict of guilty, to finally bring some much-needed truth to Chandler Halderson. Thank you. In the appellate court's ruling of Jody's appeal, they discuss at length the many issues that they agreed with Arias were extremely problematic during her trial. Those issues stem from something that is often not discussed or well understood by the general public, and that has to do with both the rules of evidence and the rules of professional conduct. These are the rules and guidelines that are set forth for every licensed attorney that directly impacts what they can or cannot do during a jury trial. Unfortunately for most people who are fans of the true crime genre, there is an enormous gap between the general public's understanding of these rules and their expectations of how defendants should be treated at trial. But allow me to elaborate. In the appellate court's ruling, they discussed a rule or obligation that exists for all representatives of the government, specifically a prosecutor, which states that a prosecutor may not engage in abusive, argumentative, or harassing conduct. They go on to discuss the importance of a prosecutor's role in a jury trial, which in a criminal prosecution is not to win a case, but to ensure that justice is done. Additionally, they discuss an issue that was so significant to them as appellate judges that they would end up reporting Prosecutor Juan Martinez to the State Bar of Arizona for sanctions and even possible disbarment. Okay, so let's go to a statement made by the prosecutor at, at the bench on April 2nd, 2013. They're in a discussion and the judge is there Ms. Willimont is there, and Mr. Martinez basically insults Ms. Willimont, talking about if he were married to her, which is an inappropriate basis to object, to discuss. It also calls into account her gender, which is inappropriate, and he also used an expletive, which would, in my experience, get you expelled from most courtrooms. How do you even defend that kind of conduct in this context of a death penalty case? I don't. I don't think that comment was appropriate in the slightest. So when a pr prosecutor walks up to the bench and engages in vulgarity to a judge, that's okay. It's that's not a okay, as long as he says it just loud enough that it doesn't get all the way to the, to the jury box. No, it's not okay at all. Now, before we continue, this is something that I categorically cannot put enough emphasis behind. An appellate court who reviews the appeal of a widely reviled defendant that they agree was completely responsible for the crimes that she was convicted of was so disgusted by the behavior of prosecutor Juan Martinez that they not only wrote one of the most contemptuous opinions I have ever read, but they referred his behavior to the State Bar of Arizona for sanctions arising from his actions. Now, that isn't simply uncommon or out of the ordinary. That is completely unheard of. In fact, Prosecutor Juan Martinez was disbarred in connection to his behavior arising from Jody's trial because of his inappropriate adult relationship with a member of the media to whom he was leaking information concerning Jody's trial. Now, I understand that a vast majority of people who watch Jody's trial cheer each and every time that Juan Martinez goes after Jody for her lies or seems to pounce on everyone and anyone who does anything he doesn't like. But that's the thing. It is because of his behavior during the trial and now the appellate court's ruling that Jody can use the language of the higher court's opinion in her upcoming filing for post-conviction relief. 
which is a mechanism by which a convicted felon like Jody Arias can petition the court for a reduction in her sentence, which by virtue of these mistakes by Prosecutor Martinez could end up with Jody Arias someday walking free. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, I want to prove to you why this legal issue is important to understand and to ensure that we all remain vigilant going forward. In the appellate court's ruling, they went through the primary disputes where they agreed with Jody's appeal concerning the issue of prosecutorial misconduct. Now, it's important to understand that these are not politically minded judges. Historically, the appellate court in Arizona typically upholds convictions and very rarely overturns them entirely, let alone issue such a harsh rebuke against the state itself. So in their opinion, this is what they had to say concerning Prosecutor Martinez's actions towards Arias during the trial. From the onset, the prosecutor's question of Arias were extremely combative and badgering. On multiple occasions, Arias answered the substance of the prosecutor's questions without parroting the precise language he used, and the prosecutor aggressively responded with some variation of, Did I ask you that? She's a little bit dumb. You said that, right? Yes, I called her dumb and stupid. Did I ask you whether or not you called her stupid, ma'am? No. I asked you whether or not you called her dumb, right? Yes. The appellate court continues through their opinion, describing the number of times that Prosecutor Martinez was argumentative and attacked Jody directly, seemingly demonstrating his anger more than anything else, including saying the following. Apart from the argumentative phrasing of questions, the prosecutor's aggressive tone and combative bullying demeanor were also reoccurring issues. Now, it's important to understand that at this moment, the appellate court is not giving Jody Arias a pass, but a majority of their ruling is comprised of a detailed examination of the state's actions throughout the entirety of Jody's trial. But since the appellate court issued their ruling, I have routinely seen people dismiss their opinion as being inconsequential, mainly because they did not award Jody a new trial. But their words carry significant weight, and it's why they spent as much time as they did preparing their opinion, going to such great lengths to chastise Juan Martinez for his behavior, and then not even leave it there, but to seek out punishment with the state bar because of how egregious his actions were. And this is another issue that we have discussed previously, that when the state brings an action against a defendant, The importance of doing it right cannot be overstated. And this is exemplified in the mere fact that when the state oversteps and when they fail to do their job correctly, it opens a door that should remain shut. Because I would rather have an entirely boring jury trial in Jody Arias' case that barely made the nightly news than have a case where a prosecutor oversteps the line and allows for the possibility of Jody Arias to someday be set free knowing how dangerous she is. Because I have personally witnessed people having their sentences reduced from post-conviction relief filings from far less than what Prosecutor Martinez was accused of by the appeals court. And please understand, the problems that arose from Jody's trial did not end with Juan Martinez's behavior towards Jody herself. Because the appellate court, they were just getting started. And the reason was that you wanted to give her something, right? No. Well, you did give her something, didn't you? Yes. And there is a code of ethics, correct? Yes. And that code of ethics prohibits you from providing gifts to somebody like the defendant, doesn't it? It wasn't a gift. Sir, isn't it true that it went over and it got to her? Didn't it? She was suicidal at the time. I'm not asking you whether or not she was suicidal, right? Am I asking you that? No, you're not. And if she was suicidal, you're not the treating physician, are you? I'm not treating her. Well, if she was suicidal, it was somebody else's responsibility to take care of it, right? Judge, objection. Can we ask the state not to yell at the witness? During Jody's trial, Dr. Richard Samuels was routinely and aggressively cross-examined by Prosecutor Martinez. It was during this interaction that Prosecutor Martinez began to call into question 
the doctor's personal credibility with regard to liking Jody Arias to the point that he offered her gifts in the form of a book that he purchased and had sent to her while she was incarcerated. Now, the appellate court would go on to say that the prosecutor had engaged in misconduct by yelling at Dr. Samuels and slapping his hands in a loud, dramatic fashion. But when defense counsel moved for a mistrial due to the state's repeated inappropriate actions, which, by the way, are not my words, but the appellate court's, Prosecutor Martinez responded to Judge Stevens by saying that it was simply his style, which he claimed bothered no one but defense counsel. Now, they go on to discuss how Prosecutor Martinez began to deride Dr. Samuels for having a possible memory problem, which is something he said to virtually everyone, and even insinuated that he may even have an inappropriate relationship or fondness for Arius. Again, defense counsel requested another mistrial on the basis of prosecutorial misconduct, which, again, the court denied. And then, the appellate court states that Prosecutor Martinez had no basis to continue with that line of questioning and even rebuke Judge Sherry Stevens for allowing it to continue. The higher court would go on to describe Prosecutor Martinez's behavior towards Dr. Samuels as belittling argumentative and devoid of any probative purpose. There were, other re- there were other examples as well. I would have to refer through my notes in order to find specific ones, but based upon my clinical judgment and my expertise and experience, she met that criteria. And you can bang on it all you want, and it's still your judgment, isn't it? Of course it's my judgment. So, to get back to it, your judgment is based on partly on the fact that she said she had trouble reading, right? Well, that was one factor, yes. They then chastised Prosecutor Martinez's comments towards Dr. Samuels after he accused the man of having developed a fond relationship with Arias, which they all agreed were a violation of the rules of evidence and the rules of professional conduct. The appeals judges even went so far as to make the declarative statement that nothing in the record supports the prosecutor's repeated assertions that Dr. Samuels engaged in improper or unethical conduct. They continue by stating that Judge Stevens had an obligation to maintain proper decorum and describe the state's actions as an impermissibly aggressive and combative demeanor. Tell me what negative things the defendant wrote about herself. I thought you asked me if she said anything negative about Mr. Alexander. Did you have a problem understanding the question? Tell me what negative things the defendant wrote about herself in those journals. That was my question. Would you show me what you're referring to? No, you're the one that just told us that you read journals before you came here into court, didn't you? I did. And you spent many hours, correct? Yes, I did. And you charged $250 an hour to read them, right? The standard fee, Mr. Am I asking if that's a standard fee? Apparently not. And this is exactly what I meant when I said that there is a vast chasm between what the general public wants to see in a jury trial from a prosecutor and what is allowed. Because I would contend that this interaction by so many people who have watched it is something that is applauded and even encouraged by those of us who know that Jody Arias is not a victim. But this is precisely why we are no longer ruled by a mob with pitchforks. It's why we formed our judiciary around fairness and objectivity. And it's why the prosecutor in Chandler Halderson's case was able to navigate a very similarly brutal crime that was clearly premeditated and then obfuscated by a defendant who was determined to lie his way to freedom. But prosecutor William Brown did not need to aggressively or angrily cross-examine witnesses in order to allow the truth to be seen for what it was. And in that case, the overwhelming evidence proved that Chandler Halderson was guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. And that's why when Chandler Halderson inevitably appeals his verdict that there will not be claims of prosecutorial misconduct that have any basis in reality because he didn't need to attack every defense witness in order to prove his point. 
But in the matter of Jody Arias, the appellate judges continued to describe in detail their disdain for the state's behavior at virtually every step of the trial. But I want to share with you a few of the most important statements that arise from their ruling and opinions that are deeply important for all of us to understand. Towards the end of their ruling, they explained that many of the prosecutor's cross-examination questions were so improper that we are compelled to conclude that he either knew or should have known of the impropriety. In other words, there is no possible basis upon which many of the prosecutor's questions could be justified. Not only were the prosecutor's questions frequently argumentative and disrespectful, some questions, particularly those posed to Dr. Samuels, contain innuendo designed to prejudice the witness without any supporting evidence. Now, as we all know, Jody Arias is not someone who is deserving of pity regardless of how she was treated by anyone, precisely because of what she did to Travis. But that's the thing. We often conflate our desire and need for justice by comparing the actions of the defendant to those of Prosecutor Martinez. And we can all agree that in comparison, there is no comparison. She is exactly where she belongs. But again, the state, the Arizona Bar Association, and the appeals courts hold prosecutors to a much higher standard than most people realize. Which is exactly why the appeals court also took issue with Prosecutor Martinez's behavior as it related to his public appearances. In fact, Prosecutor Martinez was described by a member of the media as having been treated like a celebrity because of what he was doing during the trial. He would routinely be seen taking pictures with adoring fans, primarily because his actions resonated with so many people who frankly despised Jody Arias. People admired and revered Juan Martinez because in many ways he was saying what everyone already thought about her. But the many fans of Prosecutor Martinez need to hear and understand this simple fact. The appellate court agrees with many of the legal claims made in Jody Arias' appeal. Really think about that for a second. A court that could have given her a new trial, and even said as much in their opinion, agrees with Jody Arias, the convicted felon, that Prosecutor Martinez made catastrophic mistakes in this trial. They went on to say that it is clear that the prosecutor improperly engaged in self-promoting conduct, further stating that his efforts to gain personal notoriety were beneath the office he held as a representative of the state of Arizona. Ending that segment of their opinion by saying that prosecutor Juan Martinez lost sight of his role. But after all of the pages outlining the innumerable mistakes that the court recognized this one man made during the trial of Jody Arias, they continued to address his misdeeds by outlining the improper and willful misconduct they found within the words of his closing arguments, wrongfully insinuating to the jury that if they did not find her guilty, that they themselves would be complicit in the crime that Arias committed with the higher court stating clearly that the state unquestionably exceeded permissible bounds by appealing to the jurors' passions and fears. However, it's their final conclusions found in their opinion that contain the most direct and important evidence for us to consider. They stated the following, We conclude that this is an egregious case of misconduct by a highly experienced prosecutor and we strongly disprove of his actions. And we remind the bar that this kind of misconduct can result not only in reversal of the sentence against Arius, but can also have serious personal consequences. As such, we find it necessary to refer the matter of his misconduct to the State Bar of Arizona. But for me, it's what Judge Jones stated in the final words of their opinion that leaves no doubt the overwhelming importance of this issue to the court, to the justice system, and to the future of Jody Arias's case. Judge Jones wrote, 
to be sure, Arius' conviction stands not because of the state's devotion to the pursuit of justice, but in spite of the prosecutor's willingness to put self-interest, self-promotion, and self-aggrandizement above his duty to maintain the integrity of our judicial system. The state's attorney in a criminal case is held to a higher standard in his role as a minister of justice. Yet here we are, confronted with a prosecutor whose repeated misconduct towards the superior court, other attorneys, principals, and witnesses in a criminal case was not only abhorrent to the rules of professional conduct and clearly unnecessary to obtain a conviction, but was broadcast over and over again, hour after hour, throughout a 67-day trial. And I am left dissatisfied by the serious questions raised by the prosecutor's misconduct. I cannot recall a moment in time in my career where I have come across a more scathing rebuke from a higher court to a specific prosecutor that even comes close to the words written by the appellate court in this case. The appeals judges were so dissatisfied and disgusted by what happened in this trial that they went so far as to write an opinion that included a notification to the state bar that on its own would have ended any lawyer's career. And that's why this is so important, because just a few days ago, on the 4th of July, on Jody Arias' own personal website, she shared with the world how her lawyers are currently in the process of preparing her PCR filing. A legal team that is being paid for by her throng of loyal supporters who continue to fund her comfortable lifestyle while she remains in prison. And sadly, Jody's lawyers will use the language written by these appellate judges who agree with her, language that is compelling, and those words will be used as a means to plead with the court to give Jody a lesser punishment. And here's the unfortunate reality of her sentence. The next step down from life without parole is life with parole. And that means that even if the possibility of her walking free someday is very slim, it is because of the missteps at her trial that the chances of her leaving prison are no longer zero. And if it wasn't already clear, that's why this ruling matters. The case of Jody Arias was the very first case I ever covered on this channel. Over the years, I have developed an affinity for this case because it represents the best and worst parts of our justice system. Many of us watched her case unfold over the course of several years, and it felt like there was a clear and resounding conclusion to it. We all got to experience a prosecutor who said many of the things that we were thinking and communicated in a way that expressed how we were all feeling. But the issues that the appellate court brought forward are not insignificant. And while Prosecutor Martinez's zealous prosecution may have been very entertaining to watch, we now know that his actions during the trial are the antithesis of how prosecutors are expected to act during a jury trial. And the sad part is, he knew better. And his hubris is what eventually caused him to lose his license. It's an incredibly high price to pay, with a rippling impact that now may affect the future of Jody Arias' incarceration. But that is precisely why we want our elected district attorneys putting responsible men and women in the lead chair of the state's prosecution against any defendant but especially in cases where they are facing a cold and calculated manipulator who will use every opportunity she can to get the things she has wanted since day one, her freedom. And that's why we cannot afford to forget what this case is really about. The real and true victim of this case is Travis Alexander and the Alexander family. Because Travis never got the chance to live the rest of his life, to learn and grow, to explore the world, 
to experience marriage and children, something he deeply wanted in his life. And it's for that reason why Travis deserves justice, why he deserves the advocacy of reminding the public that just because Jody Arias is in prison doesn't mean that she intends to stay there. Donovan Baring had been at Jody's side throughout the most difficult times of her life. At every pivotal moment, she needed a friend, and it was why it was so hard for her to draw the line when it finally came time for Donovan to tell Jody no. Jody's rage against those who spoke out against her had no boundaries, but one thing that Donovan knew from the very beginning was that Jody's family had always been there for her. Jody repeatedly told Tracy and Donovan both that her parents had always been loving and supportive and that while they were not perfect, they had never done anything to merit the hostility and anger that she had aimed at them over the years. So it was nothing short of shocking when Donovan received the call from Jody that she wanted her to use her social media following to accuse her father of having harmed her as a child. The accused defendant, who was about to stand trial for the homicide of Travis Alexander, was so desperate for a defense that she was even willing to throw her own family under the bus to do whatever it took to save her own life. But Donovan stood up to Jody, told her no, and then revoked Jody's access to her own social media accounts. And it was over the course of the next few days that Jody began a campaign of hateful harassment towards her former best friend, threatening her and calling her constantly, demanding that she return to her status as Jody's puppet. For a while, Donovan held her ground, but like most things with Jody, she manipulated her way back into her life and convinced her to return to her side. But before Donovan Baring could exit her journey on the chaotic Arius Expressway, she would be instructed to meet one of Jody's closest operatives, her former boyfriend, Matt, a man who was about to tell her a story that would completely change the narrative of what happened at Travis Alexander's house on June 4th, 2008. An admission that would put a second person at the crime scene an accomplice for a homicide for which Jody was about to stand trial. It was a story that would force Donovan to choose who to protect. Her former cellmate and best friend Jody Arias? Or herself? In early October of last year, I began writing my first episode for this channel. I still remember how nervous I was to publish it especially because of the fact that I was making all of this content and still do on my cell phone and I had just learned how to edit. So it would be something of an understatement to say that I truly didn't know what I was doing, but that was why I was so thankful when I got my first 10 subscribers. And the funny thing is, I still feel that way. Hitting the milestone of 50 Thousand is something that I cannot fully wrap my mind around, but I am so completely and thoroughly grateful to each and every one of you for being here, for choosing to support this channel the way you do. And even at the risk of sounding repetitive, I am so grateful for you, for your time and for being here today. Having a community of people who continue to come back, to listen, and to allow me the opportunity to share my thoughts and insights is something that truly humbles and encourages me every single day. And I never want to miss an opportunity to show and express my gratitude any way that I can. But I do have one small favor to ask. Please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Those seemingly small things are incredibly powerful ways for you to show support. So in advance, thank you so much for your time and for being a part of this truly exceptional community. Now, I will be releasing the follow-up episode to the Chris Watts series next, with new series covering many new community-requested cases coming very soon. 
And if it wasn't already obvious, I am already working on episode six of the Jody Arias series, which I know many of you want me to continue to do. So if that's you, I will continue to write new episodes for all of your favorite cases. But if there is any other case that you would like for me to cover in a future episode, please feel free to write it in the comments below. I read every single comment and I keep a list of future cases to research and feature on the channel. So if there's a case that you're interested in, please do not hesitate to share your thoughts below. I also want to personally thank our Patreon and YouTube supporters. Each of you are truly the backbone of this channel and you are the reason why I am able to spend so many hours researching and creating each and every episode. I want to give a special thank you to our producers Hazel C, Florentino Medina, and Incognito. Thank you all for your support, for your encouragement, and for being a part of a truly incredible community of people who value bringing the truth to light in everything we do. Finally, as we proceed into the last half of 2023, I want to remind everyone to be good to those around you. There is a lot of hardship happening in the lives of so many people around us. So in the next several weeks, I'm going to be announcing another giveaway to try and help alleviate some of those financial hardships. It's a very small way that I show my gratitude for this community and for your support, because the reality is that none of this would be possible without each of you. So remember to stay tuned because new and exciting content is coming soon. This has been Behind Criminal Minds. We'll see you next time.